Hi, this is Tony Stobosinski, and, and today we're going to look at one of my favorite psalms, because it's not only a messianic psalm, uh, in other words, a psalm written pointing to Jesus and was fulfilled in his death and resurrection, <clears throat> but it also gives tremendous uh, comfort as we identify with Christ, and we will share uh, being in the presence of God with him for all eternity. Uh, we who have faith in Jesus for our salvation. So Psalm 16 uh, is about the resurrection, and it talks about not being abandoned. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we'll see what that means, but it reminds me of, of promises that God made. I will never leave you nor forsake you is one of the promises of God. Another is Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And I shouldn't do this, but I'll tell you anyway. That That's from one of the Gospels. And uh, anyway, a speaker once shared a story that uh, he was on a flight. And uh, there was a nun on the flight with him, and she was terrified of flying. And uh, so he talked to her, and he said, you know, sister, you you shouldn't be afraid because uh, uh God's promised to be with us everywhere. Jesus said, uh, I'll be with you no matter where you are. And she said, that is not what he said. She said, lo, he said, lo, I am with you always. So she was afraid of going too high up because Jesus promised she was thinking was only when she was in low altitudes. But verse 9 is uh, quoted in the New Testament. And says this, my flesh, which means my body, will also dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul, my life, to Sheol, which is the grave. You will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the way of life. So there, after death and body being placed in the grave, uh, God would make this person uh, uh, come back from uh, the dead. So God's word translation, which is a bit simpler usually in the word, says, That is why my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body rests securely because you do not abandon my soul to the grave or allow your Holy One to see decay. You make the path of life known to me. So let's go back to verse 1 and look at the psalm. <clears throat> it's a prayer of protection. Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have nothing good beside you. And uh, that is true not only for Jesus as the Son of God. That's not true only for David. It's true for all of us. God is the author of life. He's the source of every good thing, uh, the father of light. Only good things come from him. And everything that we have as good comes from him and is of him. Uh, and we just confess that and realize that so we don't go trying to chase after other gods or other things. All we chase after is God himself. Verse 3, this is another one if you think about it, is very meaningful for us too. It says, As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the majestic ones. And it's uh, there are other translations you can give to this word, but very noble, majestic, wonderful in, in this writer's eyes. All my delight is in them. Well, that could be true for David. He says it's the believers and by the way, whether you're in the Old Testament times or New Testament times, uh, being righteous uh, is something God counts to us by faith in him and his promises, whether it's Abraham, whether it's David. Abraham wasn't a perfect person. Matter of fact, there was no perfect person apart from Jesus, the Messiah. All others have sinned. So saints who are on the earth... They are people who believe and put their trust in God, and he counts it to them as righteousness. So he declares believers the righteous ones. 
And the person speaking, saying, they are the majestic ones. All my delight is in them. And David could be thinking that, but so is God. And I want you to know that his delight is in you because you have uh, believed in him. You've accepted his gift, assuming that you are a believer, a Christian. And uh, that is pleasing to God the Father. And it gives delight to God the Son to know that all the sacrifice he gave uh, was worth it because you have received it by faith. <clears throat> now, verse 4 says, The pains of those who have acquired another god will be multiplied. And there's all kinds of beings you can worship or can lead you astray. But David says, I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. Just not going to have anything to do with them in any way. No witchcraft, no sorcery, no other uh, ways to the supernatural but through God himself. And then he goes to the positive. He says, the Lord, and that's this capital L-O-R-D, that's the uh, official name of God that he gave us, the one who is and was and is forever. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. In other words, if I have the Lord, I've got everything. <clears throat> you support my lot. The measuring lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. And and these are like lines that can be used for region territories. It, it speaks of an Acts. Uh, Paul talks about how God has uh, given different people in different nations places where we live. And the best place for you and the best place for me is the place that God has for you and for me. And that is always the best place. It is pleasant. And my inheritance is beautiful to me because I know my inheritance. I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ of the kingdom of God. It is the Father will is will to give us all things. And he goes on to say, I will bless the Lord who has advised me. Thank God that we can inquire of him. We can ask him questions. We can ask for guidance. And sometimes it's just not time for him to give us an answer. He doesn't just lay out every part of our life in it like a book and a blueprint. But he always advises us. He always gives us wisdom. And he directs us among the paths that he wants us to take. And he goes on to say, Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night, even at nighttime. Uh, and by the word, the word instructs here is more one like it of corrects me, warns me. Job talks about that, how God does that through dreams in the night. Even at the nighttime, God is at work in my heart and my mind, forming me and instructing me and correcting me so I know which way to go and what to avoid. Verse 8 says, I have set the Lord continually before me. And the word is a bit more multidimensional than this. It, in the Hebrew, it actually means like he's my, well, they would say like my idol. He's the one I want to be like. He's the person I look up to all the time. I want to be like him. Sometimes people say that about different athletes. Here's a football player that inspired me, and I wanted to be just like him. Or whatever it is, it can be a musician. But that's the idea here. I've set the Lord continually before me. He is my inspiration. I want to be like him. I want to follow him. And because he is at my right hand, I, I want him close to me. I will not be shaken. Everything in the world around us can be shaken. And that means shaken in a bad way. But I will not be shaken because my faith is in him. And here we come to the verse uh, that speaks about the grave and the resurrection. Verse 9 says, Therefore my heart is glad and my, my glory rejoices. And that's a hard one to interpret, but it, glory can mean honor and, and respect. Uh, so one who has been humiliated and lied about will rejoice in their honor being restore, restored. And I believe that's what is speaking here about Jesus, because they lied about him, they hated him, they slandered him, they humiliated him, they murdered him. 
But in the future, he knew that his honor would be restored and he would be rejoicing in that. My flesh, and that's just another word, a way of saying my body, will also dwell securely. So this is about security, which is interesting. Uh, betach is the Hebrew word. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And it's betach in the Lord with all your heart. So it means to trust because you know your security is in him. It's that kind of a trust. You dwell securely. Everything's okay when you put your trust and faith in him. And this is where it gets very personal for Jesus. For you will not abandon my soul to the grave, Sheol. The best way to, because we don't know more about it than meaning that. Uh, the, what happens after life actually gets spelled out even more so in the New Testament. But still we have all kinds of information in what we call the Old Testament too. And this is pertaining, speaking specifically about Jesus. We'll see in a minute that David wrote this, but this was not true for him. But for the Messiah, you will not abandon my soul to the grave. You will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. So it talks about death. It talks about dying. And now it talks about life. You will make known to me the way of life, resurrection life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And of course, this is what we have looked forward for, to uh, in our devotional life. We devote ourselves to prayer and worshiping and kneeling at the feet of Jesus and the Heavenly Father. And, uh, but we find not only advice and correction, we find fullness of joy Although, imagine how much more that will be all the time uh, after this life. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So in Acts chapter 2, Peter is going to quote this as he preaches to the people of Israel. He's trying to explain to them what has happened. And he says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, and that means he was from Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, in other words, in God's counsel, in his determination, this was the the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world. He had it all worked out, the plan on how to save us. He could fore, he foreknew and could see into the future the things that would go wrong and with sin and people re, and spiritual beings rebelling against him. But because he is eternal, he never had a beginning. He never had, will have an end. He's been always there. He had predetermined, predetermined a plan, the plan of the cross and the plan of the resurrection, resurrection and the plan of the restoration of all things. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So he is specifically speaking to people who were in the gang and the mob that put Jesus together on Good Friday. But we need to remember, too, that we're not off the hook because it was our sins, and we've all sinned also, that nailed him to the cross that he did for out of love for you and for me so that we could have forgiveness But God raised him from the dead. That's the resurrection. That's what we call Easter Sunday, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So Peter explains, he says, this is what David meant, speaking about the psalm, Psalm 16. This is what David meant when he said about Jesus. 
David was talking about Jesus in the following words of Psalm 16. I always see the Lord in front of me. I cannot be moved because he is by my side. Jesus is speaking. That is why my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also rests securely because you do not abandon my soul to the grave or allow your Holy One to decay. You make the path of life known to me. In your presence, there is complete joy. So in Psalm 16, the Apostle Peter is explaining, which I believe Jesus explained to them when he explained the scriptures to him, that this psalm spoke of, if you will, in a code, not everyone could understand, but we who have the Holy Spirit given by Jesus. And of course, Jesus as the Son of God understood it clearly. He explained it and opened up the minds of the disciples to understand the scriptures. And we know that the Psalms speak about the death, the grave, and the resurrection of Jesus. So Peter says in interpreting this Psalm 16 that it's not just about David himself. It can't be. He says, brothers, I can tell you confidently that our ancestor David died and was buried and that his tomb is here to this day. A lot of times when there are very important graveyards or tombs, uh, heroes and, and great people and they will have big monuments and everything else and, and be secure, the tomb itself. And that was true of David in the days of Peter here in Acts chapter 2. But in verse 30 says, But David was a prophet and knew that God had promised with an oath that he would place one of David's descendants on his throne. David knew that the Messiah would come back to life. In other words, David prophesied and knew about the resurrection after the Messiah would die. And he spoke about that before it ever happened. He said that the Messiah wouldn't be left in the grave and that his body wouldn't decay. So I hope Psalm 16 uh, becomes an exciting psalm for you. Remember, you become a saint, one of the holy ones that God takes his delight in, when you believe in his son Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. He takes delight in you. And the, the same reality about the future that you and I have is that there are pleasures in the presence of God. And there is life and joy forevermore.